Um, it's always tough presenting after Vicky because she's so good at doing what she does. Uh, but thankfully I don't have to present on anything science, it's all just relating to my personal anecdotal experience in adopting a low carb, high or healthy fat diet and how that's affected um, my day to day living and my uh, athletic performance. Uh, just a little disclaimer before I start, I'm not, I'm not a professional athlete, I'm not an elite athlete. I'm probably uh, somewhere between a weekend warrior and, a, and an age group competitor. So I, I love keeping active, I do all forms of, of exercise from running to swimming to cycling, a uh, bit of body weight training, Pilates, um, I like to mix it up a lot and, um, and I like to give these you know, different types of events a good red hot go. So I do like to push myself. Um, I'm going to go through three events that I've um, participated in or competed in over the last uh, several months um, whilst adopting this low carb, uh, high and healthy fat approach. The first of which was Cairns Ironman in 2014 and that, that event was held on the, or in the beginning of June of 2014. Uh, Vicky and I have been adopting a lower carb diet for probably two to three years now, closer to three years, but it's probably only in the last um, eight to ten months that we've um, incorporated the higher or the healthier fats into the diet. So for those, for the initial stages, cutting out the, the carbohydrates or reducing carbohydrates, we found very challenging to sustain. And that's something that Vicky often finds with her clients if they are trying to adopt a low carbohydrate diet that they tend to ebb in and out of it because it is hard to sustain. It's only when you're able to increase the amounts of healthier and um, more beneficial fats into your diet that, that you really get the benefits of, of what Vicky was speaking about. So, so we took that on board, probably about, or me especially, Vicky was an early adopter than I was, I took a little bit of convincing, uh, probably about six weeks before that, this event, I took, took on board more of the, the higher, healthier fats. And um, just to give you a bit of uh, insight into how I got to the actual start line, well this is, this is it, I don't know if you can read from where you are, but this was a text message that was sent to me by a very good friend of mine. Um, and I'm lucky enough to have him as a friend because he's got uh, a lot of connections in the right places. So he writes there, I'm going to do an Ironman in five weeks, do you want to join me? So here's my reply, it's tempting, my shoulder is very effed. <laughs> I'll have a go at swimming and let you know, is that Cairns Ironman? So I've actually done a mountain bike event probably a, a week or two before this message came through and I fell onto my arm and really bugged up my shoulder. So Ricky replies, he says, come on, Forbes is a sponsor. Um, if any of you know Cannibal Cycling and uh, run, Running Gear, that's uh, Glenn Forbes. Forbes is a sponsor and he can get us in and Accor will give us accommodation or rooms. We need to do something, I'm a fat F. <laughs> okay, so then I reply and I said, you had me yet, come on. <laughs> so then Ricky replies, 8th of June, let's do it. And then I reply, I just need one practice swim, I'll give it a go. So, um, so that, that was five weeks out before the event, and um, that's actually a, quite a long lead into an Ironman for me because a year before, uh, oh, sorry, 2012, I actually got a, a spot two days before Melbourne Ironman, which I accepted. So, uh, so five weeks was, was plenty of time to, to get my head around things. So I haven't been doing um, much swimming or running for about 12 months prior to this just because um, I was getting fed up with a whole lot of injuries that I had. Obviously I wasn't swimming because my shoulder was, was stuffed from the cycling injury. Um, but I had been doing quite a lot of mountain biking and, and road cycling. So I gave myself a five week plan to work off and during this time I really adopted the, the higher healthy fat uh, component of LCHF in, into my daily nutrition. You're and already fat adapted, basically, or not? Uh, it's hard to tell. I don't know. <laughs> you know, um, probably, probably not truly fat adapted. No, because I, I was, I was quite particular on my my intake of carbohydrates during that period as well. Mm -hmm. um, what I found over the period of those uh, the, the five weeks leading into the event was miraculously my shoulder um, 
completely resolved, you know, our, our sort of self-diagnosed an impingement syndrome and uh, tendinopathy, and I thought this was going to be a chronic event, but it, it sort of miraculously cleared up. Um, I've had a couple of knee reconstructions. I was carrying a bit of the tendinopathy in my patella tendon. I had Achilles tendinopathy. I was I thought I was a wreck, but it, but all of the stuff just miraculously disappeared. I thought maybe it was all the adrenaline and excitement leading into the event, but um, now uh, it's more to do with the, the healthier fats in the diet that were helping to decrease the inflammation. Um, so, um, so I did all the training and I, I, was, I was leading into the event and got to the week of the event and I said to Vicky, okay, well, you know, I've been eating this low-carb, high-fat diet. Um, I need a nutrition strategy for the event now, for that for race day, for leading into the event and for race day. So should I go back to carbo loading two, three days out, start getting into the pastas and rice and cereals and uh, white bread and lollies and Gatorade? Um, do I need to go and get some gels? Like, what's the deal? And she said, no, 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 look, you're my experiment. Um, you're going to do this race, LCHF. You're not touching any of that stuff. So I said, are you sure? She said, she said, what's the worst that can happen? You know, you'll end up in hospital. <laughs> so we sorted out life insurance that week. And, um, and uh, I, just, I, I said, okay, you know, you're my wife. I, I trust that you love me and you, you, you obviously care for my, my well-being, so I'm going to give it a go. Um, but this is just an example of what my pre or what my race nutrition looked like in the Ironman that I did in 2011. So I put a, a Facebook post up, and this is you know, April 28, 2011. This was a day before um, Port Macquarie Ironman in New South Wales. This is what I plan to consume during the Ironman trial on Sunday. So there's 12 gels there. There's four energy bars. There's a protein bar for after the event. There's uh, no dose tablets just to get that extra kick of caffeine and there's a whole lot of um, electrolyte tablets there to drop into my, my fluids. So that's, that, that's the sort of, um, that's the nutrition that I consume, that I actually eat, but then obviously during the event as well, I'd be having Gatorade, I'd be reaching for Coke, probably in the latter stages of the ride and the run as well, and uh, not to mention a whole lot of water as well to sort of stay hydrated the whole time. So that, that's quite scary. And the thing with these, uh, all eight Ironman events that I had done previously was um, I always had gut issues. Um, I always got sick to death of eating sweet stuff, you know. So by the time I got halfway through the ride, like Vicky said, it's a rolling smorgasbord. Um, I just couldn't bear having any more sweet stuff, but I knew I needed it to keep me going. I'd always hit the wall at some stage. I'd always get cramps in, in my quads, in my hammies, in my lower back. Um, I'd, be, I'd be an emotional wreck towards the, the, towards the end of the ride, I'd start getting teary. Then I'd get up, stop running and think, oh, I'm in my happy place and I've only got a marathon to go. And then all the way through the run, I'd, I'd, I'd realise, hang on, I've, I've been going for one and a half, two hours, and I've got another hour and a half, two hours to go, so I'd, I'd you know, dip down into emotional low again. And then you know, with 500 metres to go, I'd go, yippee, this is the best day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and, and in, in my recovery post event, you know, I wouldn't want to look at my running shoes for like four to six weeks afterwards. I just, I'd just be flat. I'd be coughing. I, I just, just wasn't, wasn't into exercise after doing these events. Um, so, adopting a, a different strategy was probably a good idea. You know, there's that saying: if you, you, you keep on doing the same thing and expect a different result, that's a good definition of insanity. So. Um, I said to Vicky, well, I can't go into the event with nothing, you know, I'll, compared to everyone else, I'll look out of place, I need something. So she said, okay, well, you might need to satisfy your hunger, it's going to be a long day, somewhere around 10 plus hours, um, uh, how about some nut butter? So we went to the shops, we found this organic um, almond nut butter and macadamia nut butter, which has got a very high fat component, very low carbohydrate component, a lot protein components. And all it was was 100% almonds, 100% macadamias. So I took it out of the jar and I, you can see here I dispensed it into this 
plastic flask that's normally used for carbohydrate gels. And I had two of those, one for the ride, one for the run. And uh, in terms of my new, uh, hydration strategy, well, that was just water. No electrolyte tablets, uh, no sports drinks, nothing like that, just plain H2O. And um, uh, leading up to the event, uh, same thing again, I, I stayed away from all the highly processed, um, high carb foods, and I just stuck to my normal day to day nutrition. Um, uh, I did make a rookie mistake though, the night before the event, um, we were walking around the streets of Cairns looking for something to eat, some, uh, somewhere where we could find a, a low carb, high fat meal. The only thing that we could find that sort of resembled that was at an Indian restaurant. And um, I was quite hungry, so I decided I'd, I'd order a few dishes. One of them was a uh, pretty hot chicken masala. <laughs> and then that came back to what would be the next day. And I thought, I don't know, I don't know why I did that, I don't know why people let me order that. <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> so anyway, um, that, that was my pre-race meal. Um, the morning of the event, normally I'd be having pikelets, crumpets, white bread, jam, honey, you know, just to top up those fuel supplies. I'd normally down one or two gels. I'd be sipping on a sports drink leading up to the, the swim start. But this time was completely different. I just had a double espresso and I was just sipping on a little bit of water, and that, that was it. Swimming really well, got out of the water in a time, um, you know, which exceeded my expectations, given that my shoulder was stuffed, you know, six weeks before that. Um, got on the bike, and all I was doing was having water, and occasional uh, sips from that, that plastic bottle of, of, the, um, of the nut butter. In hindsight, I probably didn't even need the nut butter. I was just having it because you know, 180 kilometers and five hours you get a little bit bored, so give, give your mouth something to do. You're not speaking to anyone, so at least I could move my mouth around a little bit, chewy. Um, it, all in all, in the ride, I probably had about two to two and a half liters of water. You know, and it was such a good feeling to be able to ride straight past an aid station and not feel obliged to stop and take three bottles on board, one water, one Gatorade, one Coke. You know, I just kept on going. and. Um, and then not having to worry about where my nutrition was going and how I was going to put it in and setting my alarm at 15 minute intervals to keep on getting this nutrition in all the time. Um, it was still an unknown for me, but my energy levels were really good. Um, I got to the end, the later stage of the bike, the last 30 kilometers, and I did start to fatigue, but I figured that's because the longest ride I had done leading up to this event was probably about 80, 90 k's. And you know, there, there I was demanding 180 k's out of my muscles. So I did fatigue a little bit, but surprisingly I didn't cramp. There were no cramps. Um, and and that, that for me was a big thing, because normally I'd get to 150 k's of the bike leg and my quads and hammies would be cramping and I'd be very stiff and sore in the lower back. Didn't get any of that. Um, started the run. And uh, I took my, my, my flask with the, the nut butter on the run and probably after the first kilometre, I just threw it in the bin. I thought, oh, I need this. I'm, I'm not hungry and I can't see myself getting hungry. So I turfed it in the bin. First 10 kilometres of my run were really good and I felt really good. I think I might have clocked about 43 minutes looking back at the splits, which, which is a good pace. Probably a little bit too excited, maybe. <laughs> and then... Um, and, and then my gut started playing up that chicken masala came, came and said hello. And, uh, and I wasn't in a happy place. So for the next 10 kilometers, it, there was quite a lot of walking going on with, with quite a lot of clenching at the same time. <laughs> I, I did have to have a, a few uh, toilet breaks along the way, which weren't very successful. And then eventually at about the 20K mark, I, I sat down in you know, my own little toilet cubicle and I, I spent about 10 minutes there, composed myself, got rid of all the evidence from the night before. And, and I, I got out of that toilet and I was, I was running like, like a gazelle. It was unbelievable. Um, I was, for the first 10 kilometers, I, was, I actually was running with a, a guy that I knew from a, a previous um, training group that I was with. And then the next 10 kilometers, he, he kept on running while I was staggering along. And um, I just thought, there's no way I'm going to catch back up to him. So he basically, well, 10 kilometers while I was walking, he was running. Um, I actually caught back up to him with about 10 kilometers to go. And once I caught back up to him, I said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm here. I'm not racing for sheep stations. Let's just finish this thing off together. Um, so the last 10 k's we did together, which was great. 
Um, he's done a lot of Ironman triathlons. I've done a lot, so it was good for us to do one and finish one together. Um, I did actually reach for a Coke a couple of times, twice in the last probably five or six kilometres. So all in all, I would have had somewhere around, I don't know, 300 mils, 250, 300 mils of Coke. And like I said to Vicky, I don't know why I did that. Maybe it's because I was just delirious or maybe it's because um, I wasn't truly fat adapted and my body was craving a bit of sugar to get me across the line. Maybe I just wanted that taste in the, my mouth, I don't know. But I, look, I don't suspect it did anything to aid in my performance to getting me across the line, but I did do that. So that was my first experience with LCHF for endurance events, quite a big one to take on board. And, and what it showed me was that you can successfully race these events on a, on a low carbohydrate strategy. A few of my friends who did this event were laughing at me beforehand. They were saying, we're going to come and visit you in hospital. And then, you know, crossing the line ahead of them was, was a big, you know, th this, this is the stuff actually works. Uh, but they still yet to, to adopt it. Um, uh, so, so the big messages from this, or the, the learning that I got, was there is an alternative to highly processed, high carbohydrate sports nutrition. Like Vicky said, it's liberating, you know, you, you don't have to carry all this fuel on board. You've got the fuel, it's just a matter of being able to use it by changing your day-to-day -day nutrition. Fat adaptation takes time. Like I said, I might not have been truly fat adapted for this event. It was only six weeks that I'd actually embraced this. Um, there's some uh, authors that say it can take six to nine months to become truly fat adapted. So you do need to give it time. Um, like I said, I didn't get cramping during the events. Um, my recovery was superb. Um, to the point where I was training, two or three days later, I was actually back training again and I was keen to train again. The week after the event, there was a, a trail run, the Salomon Trail Series, which was at Studley Park. I don't know if any of you did that. 15 kilometer event. Vicky had entered uh, prior and she, she said to me, why don't you come and roll around the course? Um, kids are at the, at, at the in-laws, they're sleeping, you know, sleeping over so we can go and and do this event and not have to worry about them. So I said, all right, I'll give it a bash. And I went there and I felt so good. And I just, um, I, was, I ran four minute K pace, which for me is pretty good. And, and that's a week after um, my 10 hour plus journey doing Ironman Python. So recovery was really good. Okay, any questions on that one? How did your time get better? Um, yeah, I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> Sorry. So, so my, my, my quickest Ironman is nine and a half hours, my slowest Ironman is twelve and a half hours. So the twelve and a half one was the one where I had two days to prepare. Um, this one was in the middle, it's just over here. Um, like Vicky said, you, if you take um, fat adapted athletes and you take um, high carbohydrate athletes, the, their performances are almost on a par. But it's just the convenience factor and it's the overall health benefits of adapt, uh, adapt, uh, adopting a low carbohydrate, high fat diet that, that trump every time. Less gut issues, less cramping, all of that sort of stuff. Um, uh, you know, I only had a five week lead up into this. With minimal running and, and swimming, uh, moderate amounts of cycling. Whereas the time when I did nine hours 30, it was about a six or seven month lead up where I was really training the house down, you know, 15 to 20 hours of training a week. Okay, so the next event that I'd like to speak about is the Falls Creek Mountain Raid, raid which was um, uh, in February, just, um, just about five weeks ago, somewhere around there. And um, uh, I was starting to lose a little bit of motivation with my training or my, my daily exercise regime. And I wanted to give myself something to do just to wake up my running legs because I hadn't been doing that much running since Ironman Cairns. Wanted to pick up my running again and thought this might be a perfect opportunity to actually scare myself into doing some running. So if, if, if you don't know about this event, great event, I encourage you all to do it. Didn't get paid to say that. But it's, a, it's, it's three runs over 24 hours. So there's, there's a 10, oh sorry, 11 and a half, it was advertised as a 10 kilometer run, it was actually 11 and a half kilometers on the Saturday morning. Then the Saturday afternoon is a four kilometer run, two k's up the uh, banks along the ski, uh, uh, ski lift. 
2 k's straight back down, and then the Sunday morning is a 10 and a half kilometer run. So it's all trail running, mountain running, uh, lots of uphills, lots of downhills, very few, um, you know, uh, flat sections. Yeah, there's a little bit of flat sections on the high plains, but other than that, it's just up and down. So my conditioning wasn't great for this event because I live in Malden East and a lot of the running I'm doing is, is, is very flat. So I need to move out to these areas to get the hills. Um, uh, I entered the event about three weeks before, beforehand, and um, just tried to pack as much running as I could leading up to the event, which was maybe about three runs a week. Um, leading into the event, um, similar to Cairns Ironman, I just kept my nutrition exactly as it was. We left Melbourne on the Friday afternoon, um, got to Falls Creek Friday evening. Uh, dinner consisted of sort of a, 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 a plate of lettuce, cucumbers, tomatoes, avocado, and salmon. And, uh, and I just had uh, some macadamia nuts to snack on. Then um, uh, breakfast before the event consisted of a double espresso. I think I might have put a little blob of butter in there as well, just to add a bit more fat to that. And then I went off and did the run. The first uh, two, three kilometers were all uphill, which I was very comfortable with. Um, obviously a very different event to an Ironman triathlon. So Ironman triathlon was strength endurance. This is more strength and power. Um, what really got to me though was the two k's of uh, downhill, really steep down, down the mountain, where my quads just got smashed. I was in condition for that. And then five k's of gradual uphill all the way back to the finish line. So that was event number one. I had about three or four hours of downtime before event number two. And um, during that time I had another meal similar to what I had for dinner, which was the lettuce, cucumber, tomato, avo, smoked salmon, a few, a few uh, macadamia nuts. I think I had another double espresso. Yeah, we went to the cafe there, had another double espresso. Um, the weather was foul, as you can see, and uh, the first event, uh, when I crossed the line, Mickey said, oh, great, let's go back to the room. Um, the second event, I said, are you coming up to watch me? She said, not a chance. <laughs> she was in the bed, covers over, reading the book. So I went up to the second event, and that was straight up the hill was okay, although I must say I've never maxed out my heart rate by walking up, up until this, this time. <laughs> so it was, it was sort of hands and feet sort of stuff. Um, I didn't see anyone running up the hill. Even Jared Polar was there, the uh, adventure race, and I saw him walking up the hill, so I didn't feel too bad. Then coming down the hill was another smash fest on my quads. Um, almost rolled across the finish line because my legs were like jetty. Um, so for the first two events, I actually managed to grab fifth spot overall, which I was quite happy with. There's probably about 50 or 60 runners per event. And then the next event on the Sunday morning was that 10 and a half k event. I didn't think I'd be able to get out of bed. My quads were that sore. Um, oh, sorry. Let me just backtrack to dinner that night. We managed to find a, a good. Um, uh, uh, something good off the menu at one of the local restaurants there, which was a, a chicken dish, and it was, it was almost soaking in this um, garlic butter sauce, so that was very appropriate. And um, so I scoffed that down. Then the next morning, I didn't have a, a breakfast at all. All I had was uh, another coffee. Went to the start line, and surprisingly, I felt pretty good, and, and I think for the first three, four kilometers, I was actually leading, uh, which is, very atypical for me. Uh, and then um, we started getting to some of the big hills where my, my quads were just screaming from the, the, day of the, the day before. And I lost a bit of ground, but I actually ended up a third spot overall on that run and, and managed to get uh, first in my age group, 20 to 39. So I was pretty happy overall. And, and what I found was um, once you've fat adapted, your body system is able to tap into an almost endless fuel supply. I didn't really eat that much food at all through that 24 hour period, or 36 hour period, even if you look at the Friday afternoon and evening as well. Um, the, the reason why I didn't want to eat that much was because I had three events back to back and I didn't want all this food in my body that was going to upset my gut and make me feel sluggish and bloated. So I intentionally reduced the amount of calories that I was eating and even, even in doing that, my, um, my energy levels were really good and, and my performance was great, much better than I expected. <coughs> 
So fat oxidation for fuel crosses the spectrum of exercise during uh, exercise duration and intensity, despite what clinical physiology suggests. And Vicky touched on this with the faster study. Um, you, you would think that once you get to those higher thresholds, that's when you you're going to be you're going to be burning less fats and you're going to rely more on carbohydrates for that that explosive power and strength that's required. But you know, I, I require a lot of that uh, jumping from uh, uh, little uh, rocks and jumping over boulders and uh, jumping over tree roots and that sort of thing. So there was a lot of plyometric type activities in these runs, which I was able to cope with perfectly well, uh, fueled by fat. So fat does cross that spectrum of um, of exercise intensity. Um, it might only be those really explosive. Uh, powerful movements that uh, powerlifters might have to perform, or 100 meter sprinters need to perform, where you where you might need those excess carbohydrates to to fuel what you're doing. Uh, the last one, any sorry, any questions on that that event? No. Okay. So the last event that I want to speak about is one that that occurred a couple of days ago, and that was run for the kids. Um, and I was very excited to be able to do this because that that bloke next to me is uh, not my brother, he's, he's my training training buddy of several years and he's he's adopted a low carb high fat approach as well because we do exactly what Vicky tells us to do. <laughs> and he ran a time which is comparable to times that I've run on previous occasions for run for the kids. So and, and that was um, on a, a high fat approach, low carb. Um, I didn't touch any water on the course, which is a great thing as well. You know, people are stopping to grab uh, water and sports drink, and I'm just running straight through the middle of them. Um, before the event was a, a, a coffee. Um, I didn't really have time to think about nutrition strategy at all because I picked the number up on Saturday afternoon, so I didn't really, couldn't really think about carb loading even if I wanted to. Um, you know, the the thing that 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 upsets me now is seeing how many people are, are still using carbohydrate gels, sports drinks, all the uh, electrolyte replacements, formulas, energy bars, and it's just not necessary. Um, you know, this event took an hour, so you, you can do that on the glucose stores, but obviously my, my sort of, my insulin's right down, my glucose stores are minimal, so I, I, did, I did this run on fat and, and my run time was um, you know, within uh, minutes of what I've run previously. Um, this is a little rant, rant that I had uh, when I got to the finish line. There was two uh, massive tables, one on the left with the water, which no one was touching, and one on the right with all the sports drink, which everyone was going for. And all the volunteers were sort of huddled around the one with the, water, the sports drink, handing those out. So I wrote there, apologies for being so cynical. But for these events that promote a healthy lifestyle, why do we continue to get subjected to artificial products that are con contributing to chronic disease? Endless leaders of sports drink to assist with your insulin resistance. So obviously what you don't know, you don't know. And, and that's what Vicky touched on. You know, we've, we've been fed information that um, at one point was up to date and valid. But um, as we've seen through research that's been done and is being done, um, what we knew 10 years ago is very different to what we know now. It was just a matter of keeping up to date with the latest science and evidence and research to know that um, consuming all this stuff might help um, in the short term, but in the long, time, long term you're doing your body a real injustice in your overall health. Any questions in there? Okay, so for me, um, I use all these events as as personal anecdotal evidence that low carb, high fat works, and you know everyone's got, everyone's different. Uh, just like we physically different on the outside, we physiologically different on the inside. So to find your um, to find your carbohydrate tolerance point is going to be different for everyone. Like Vicky said, some people may need to cut right back to 20 grams a day if you really insulin resistant. Whereas if you're more, or sorry, carbohydrate resistant, if you're more tolerant, then you might be able to go up to 80 to 100 grams of carbohydrates a day. But it's very rare that you need anything more than about 120 to 150 grams of carbohydrates a day, even if you're a Tour de France cyclist or a 
an ultra endurance runner. Um, and the, the, the great thing for me is, is I, I feel good. Vicky spoke about just eating real food. Um, you know, there's there's nothing packaged in our in our shelves. We, you, you walk into some people's homes and it looks like it's a mini Coles or Safeway with all the packaged uh, processed products. We go shopping at the farmers market or the local market. Um, it's very rare that we walk into a commercial uh, supermarket, and if we do, we stay away from the aisles and we're always in the fresh produce section. So that, that, that's the, like Vicky said, the core of us all is just to eat real food and to eat, eat the, the macronutrients in the uh, quantities that work for you. And in order to work that out, it just is trial and error. Um, so I'll continue to challenge myself with dip, uh, different events which uh, work different energy, energy systems <coughs> in my body. Uh, the next one I've got coming up actually on Sunday is an Olympic distance triathlon. Um, and then next month I've got a 200 kilometer bike race uh, on the Great Ocean Road. Um, later in the year I'm going to do, there's a Spartan race, and if anyone's heard of the Spartan race, which is an obstacle course race, so I'm doing a 42 kilometer event, which uh, has 70 plus obstacles. So, you know, by, by, by continually challenging your different energy systems in your body, you'll figure out what works for you. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more information. There's, there's uh, how-to guides and, um, and ideas and recipes and meal plans. You know, how do you actually put this all into practice? So Vicky is very clever and I'm lucky to have her um, you know, at my fingertips. Um, you can too. She, she does work uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, individual consultations. Um, and she can do that face to face or via Skype. So there's, I know that you know, at least a couple of times a week, she's talking to people from all over Australia. Uh, Vicky also runs workshops. So it's a, it's an hour per session, which runs for four weeks. So it's one one session per week for four weeks. And those workshops are limited to a maximum of twelve people, minimum eight, maximum twelve. Uh, both of those. Um, forms of consultation, uh, they both value packed with a whole lot of information um, that gives you the how-to guides and the tips and ideas of how to implement uh, LCHF into your life. Um, we've also got a membership site that we've set up this so that, that gives you um, access to a whole lot of recipes, meal plans, um, how-to guides, tips, ideas, uh, video tutorials, um, and that's just the nutrition section. We've also got an exercise section and a mindset section as well, but that's for another day. Um, and, and as well is, is an online forum, so that's like a chat room to have access to, to Vicky 24-7. So if you, if you go to a market and you see a product, take a picture of that product and you send it through on the, the forum and say, what do you think about this, or how can I use this in my cooking, or whatever the question is. Um, if you've got a, a burning question, you can just um, access Vicky that way. And then uh, Vicky put a slide up about keeping in touch. Uh, Eat, Play, Love, you've got that brochure there. There's uh, six videos that you can access there, which just go into a lot more detail of all the science behind all of this, and then the implementation um, from there. Um, Acacia Health is, is our actual physical clinic and on that site is where we put a whole lot of blogs. So I'll blog more about the events that I'm doing and some of the ranks that I have and then Vicky blogs more about um, uh, all the LCHF science and um, she puts recipes up there and meal ideas and, and, and uh, meal plans and things like that. Uh, Facebook, we're posting stuff all the time and then if you want to get us on other forms of social media that's accessible as well. Thank you for your time and attention, and uh, you're welcome to ask both Vicky and I questions. <laughs>